You're listening to Veg Your Best. There has never been a more important time to be vegan. My name's Michelle Olander, and I'm a life coach, a life coach for vegans wherever they are along their vegan journey. And if I could go vegan in my 50s with all my excuses, I know you can start moving in that direction too. One decision, one choice at a time. That's how you veg your best. Episode 137, World Vegan Travel with Bridie Reed. Welcome, my veg your bestie. Welcome back. You know, when this episode goes live on April 18, 2023, I will most likely be in the south of Spain with some of my grandchildren. In fact, I'm actually scheduled to be doing a vegan market tour in Seville with my husband, my daughter, my son-in-law, and their two children with a company called Seville Vegan Tours on the very day that this goes live. So that should be fun. And it's always kind of funny when I'm talking to you from the past about the future. But anyway, there'll be much, much more about that vegan market tour with Seville Vegan Tours later. Veg Your Best has got a lot of uh, a lot of road trips going on right now. And you may or may not know that I just drove up by myself from Florida to New England, actually to Massachusetts, while my husband had a business trip. And that was generally, thankfully, uneventful, <laughs> which is what you want from a long car journey, I think, in general, except for uh, one impossible burger that I ordered without mayo and ketchup, but showed up with bacon and cheese. So that was uh, that was a waste of a lot of things. And I had already left the area before I opened it up. So anyway, sometimes things go wrong. But I was able to stop a variety of times at uh, supermarkets, at a Whole Foods. Um, I had good food with me. I also stopped it at Chipotle, in case you're curious what brands I stop at. Probably won't be trying an Impossible Burger at Burger King anytime again anytime soon. Uh, but anyway, this was not a leisurely drive or a sightseeing. I was actually just trying to get home efficiently. But the highlight was stopping at my younger daughter's house about a couple of hours short of getting home to Massachusetts and um, getting a home-cooked meal of pasta and grilled veggies and bruschetta. And it was, um, well, my three-year-old grandson said when I got there, it's vegan bapcha. So that was wonderful. I was tired when I got there, but after a delicious meal and hugs, I was ready to finish up my trip. So that was vegan travel because that was me traveling while vegan. But it's nothing like what today's guest, Bridie Reed, puts together for her clients at World Vegan Travel. Bridie Reed and her partner Seb are the visionaries, the founders, and the owners of World Vegan Travel, where they put together gorgeous, high concept travel in countries like, well, too many for me to name here, but France and Italy, Switzerland, Botswana, South Africa, Canada, South Korea, Thailand, Vietnam, many, many more places. Now, previous guest on Veg Your Best, Colleen. Patrick Goudreau has partnered with Bridie and World Vegan Tours on occasion, and you can hear a lot more about those on episode 124. But suffice to say that what Bridie orchestrates are tours where vegans travel with other like-minded people to explore the world sustained by fabulous food and activities in gorgeous locations. Should we should we put a Veg Your Best tour together with Bridie? I think it could be fun. 2024, just saying. Anyway, travel is always a perpetual topic here at Veg Your Best and with my coaching clients, of course. And I, I think you're going to love Bridie's nine tips for vegan travel anywhere. Nine tips for vegan travel anywhere. I think you're going to get why tip number one is my personal favorite. Anyway, let's not waste another minute. All the links to World Vegan Travel will be in the show notes. So just sit back 
and relax. And I'll catch you on the other side of the interview. Bridie Reed from World Vegan Travel. Welcome to Veg Your Best. Thank you so much, Michelle, for having me on. I'm so excited to be here. Well, I am excited too. And travel is a perennial topic among, I guess, a lot of vegans, certainly among my uh, listeners and among my clients. Um, It's not, it's one of those last things other than family members that people go, yeah, but how could I possibly? So you're going to talk to us today about nine best tips for being a vegan traveler anywhere, right? That's right. Yep. These are nine pretty big tips that I hope that your listeners will be able to use uh, whenever they go traveling. So I'm excited to share them. That's marvelous. And and so before we get into those, let me know a little bit about your vegan journey, as they say. Sure thing. So I was vegetarian from a very young age and I had lived in many countries around the world and I was living in Hanoi, And I was at that point by that time, quite a reluctant vegetarian. I kind of had this feeling that uh, I was kind of missing out on a lot of experiences, you know, living in Vietnam as a vegetarian. And I was considering going back to eating animals. And then um, just by this bizarre twist of fate, I guess we would call it certainly a very wonderful thing that happened. My partner Seb he purchased for me one of the first iPhones way back in 2009 and um, I've always enjoyed listening to the spoken word so I actually discovered podcasts in 2009 so quite a long time and I just sort of stumbled across this podcast that was called Vegetarian Food for Thought at that time and it's hosted and continues to be hosted by Colleen Patrick Goudreau. There were so few podcasts at that time, I will say. And um, I just learned about veganism through this podcast. It was called Vegetarian, but it was actually vegan. And I learned about veganism. I didn't know any vegans at this point. And pretty much straight away, the information presented in that podcast inspired me to go vegan and also some of the hows to adjust to this lifestyle. And I will say that it had a profound impact on me. I went vegan pretty much overnight. My partner joined me six months later. And long story short, which I guess is kind of like a funny little um, full circle kind of thing, we now collaborate with Colleen Patrick Goudreau. She's a dear friend of ours on these luxury vegan group tours that we run. So she, you know, was an idol to me. I really respected her. She became a good friend. And now we work on this exciting business venture together. So it's it's quite a, a full circle kind of thing. That is a full circle. Uh, you know, I, I can understand. I can understand a, several parts of what you've just said. The there is a sense when you are, especially in a um, uh, a culture which is not vegetarian or vegan, and you respect that culture, and you are a guest in that culture, there is there is a strong feeling of discomfort sometimes to say, no, I don't eat what you're offering me. I don't eat what is normal for you and your family and your and your other citizens in your community. So that is that is a discomfort. Mm-hmm. And so one of those things that we always recommend is what you got was you had a a mentor, a friend, a fellow traveler, if you will. And and you found that in Colleen and it gives you that extra bit of support, doesn't it? Oh, absolutely. Um, Anyone who knows Colleen and her work know that she's a very good communicator and she's passionate about effective communication to a result now where I feel perfectly happy to explain exactly what I need in a way that I hope is not going to hurt anyone's feelings, um, whether it's in a homestay situation or staying in a luxury hotel or whatever it is. So, you know, I'm, I'm very able to communicate exactly what I want, hopefully in a way that doesn't make the listener uncomfortable. Yeah, because we we also need to sometimes borrow somebody else's belief in that possibility and also the words, the languaging of how to ask for something. And Colleen, of course, she's a very respectful person and you know that she deeply respects other cultures and and other countries and other communities. Absolutely. 
That so that's I think that's a marvelous thing. I I think also a lot of us um have been uh well, we've been raised to be polite and let our ideas go first so that someone else feels comfortable. And that's not a bad thing as long as it's not doesn't have a bad, you know, uh, result for us. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I think there is a line that is possible to get to where we can, you know, um, be polite to a guest in someone's home or a guest in someone's culture and, um, you know, enjoy the elements that are vegan friendly and, you know, express our needs for having a vegan experience as well. So I think there is a line that can be navigated there. So tell me about you as a travel professional. Tell me where that began. Sure. Well, I've always really been interested in travel right back from when I was a little girl and my mum would share me her travel stories of when she was going behind the Iron Curtain in the 1960s. She did some really adventurous, cool things. So I think that was kind of originally that got me started. I lived in a, I moved to Australia when I was 18 and um, of course, that was a big upheaval and a new experience. And basically, I guess my foray into travel as a professional began when I was in my mid 20s. And I got a job as a tour leader, as it's called then, um, for a company called Intrepid Travel, which is a really big um, group tour company. And I did that for five years. As you can imagine, I learned a lot in that time. And then I met my partner, Seb, um, who was uh, a, also a tour leader for Intrepid Travel. You know, we met, we fell in love and we decided that we wanted to be together and not living out of suitcases all the time. And then we moved to Vietnam and um, we lived there for several years. And it was during this time that I became vegan we became friends with Colleen Patrick Gaudreau and over one of our many trips that we did together, something I didn't say is that we have traveled a lot together. The four of us, me, Seb and David and Colleen have traveled a lot together, the four of us to lots of different places. And over a, over a glass of wine, I think we talked about, well, you know, we have a little bit of experience running tours and traveling. I should also add that Seb is an expert in productions, TV production services. So he has a lot of logistics mm. background there. I'm an educator as well. I worked for 12 years in schools as well. Um, so we said to Colleen, well, how about we put together a trip for your travelers to Thailand? And she graciously agreed. And that was kind of how it all started. So now we're running um eight trips I think it is this year in 2023 and as well as all of that we also I also collaborate with a number of other vegan travel professionals and we're actually putting together a vegan travel association the VTA where we're looking to educate um businesses that are looking to become more vegan friendly and also provide inspiration to potential vegan travelers as well by online events and our website that we're also putting together. So that's quite a lot, I think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And Asia is for many Americans, North Americans. Most of my listeners are in North America with a, with a sprinkling in, um, in the UK and Europe. Um, Asia is a more challenging location in terms of people feeling comfortable like am I making a mistake do I even know what's normally in this food so can I even ask an intelligent question about it and will language be a barrier so I think it, it would be um among I mean it's it would be one of the most um necessary to have that kind of intervention fr from someone like yourself for for a vegan traveler Exactly. So of course, you know, vegan travelers with the tips that I'm going to share today, they can, uh, they can go out and travel with a fairly high degree of confidence that what they're going to be getting is vegan. But what we're doing with vegan group tours is, you know, you don't have to worry about any of that. You can just sit back and enjoy the ride because someone in this case, Sebastian and I, Seb and I, we are 
looking after all of those details. We've done all of that pre-work so that you can ensure that you are having a vegan experience with other like-minded guests and, you know, not have to do all of that other organization and travel that comes along with designing a vacation for yourself, whether you're a vegan or a non-vegan, you know, whether it's just like booking hotels or what activities that you want to do. But of course we do all of that, but of course we make sure that it's a fun vegan food experience as well. And that you're doing activities that will align with a vegan lifestyle. So among those things, I know I was just speaking to someone casually um, the other day he was speaking of Thailand, which you're saying was the first tour that you arranged with Colleen Patrick Goudreau. Um, he was saying, oh, the elephants are everywhere. And he really enjoyed them. And I didn't I didn't decide to to say anything about it at that point. But that is something many vegans would be very uncomfortable about. Correct. Yes. I think you're referring to like the elephant riding experiences mm. that happen a lot. And it's um, and I'm happy to let you know and your listeners know that there's been a huge amount of awareness that has been raised about the the cruel as cruelty aspects regarding elephant riding um and as a result of that there are some really great sanctuaries that you can visit that are that are forever homes for um for elephants that have retired from this industry, for example. Um, but then there are also, which is very confusing, and, and I talk about this, how to navigate this in my tips for vegan travel, is, you know, sometimes, you know, former elephant riding places will capitalize on this new awareness and kind of make themselves out to be sanctuaries when maybe they're not even in our own countries there are no sort of necessarily some strict associations or guidelines that sanctuaries have to adhere to to or accreditation process and it's the same in other countries too so it can be a little bit hard to navigate that as well but I'm happy to say that generally speaking in Thailand, there's quite a lot of an awareness about this, the impacts of elephant riding. Um, but then it's just, you know, how can you enjoy and support the, the good work that sanctuaries are doing in Thailand without sort of inadvertently supporting, um, you know, a for-profit <laughs> kind of, not a scam, but, you know, something that might not necessarily be something the vegan travelers would want to support. Hmm. Well, I think anytime we ask, even if we don't necessarily know that we're getting exactly what we wanted, just just asking as visitors, as travelers, as customers, I think does it it's a, it's an activism of its own. I agree with you. And I would even go so far as to say, you know, even if you do what you consider your due diligence, you might make a mistake you might screw up and you're like oh this isn't what I thought it was going to be at all and then you know we have a have this instinct to just oh no I'm a terrible vegan I've really messed up I've made a mistake yeah you know maybe you do regret booking that experience but you can still use your voice to explain um you can use your voice to spread the word about this experience so for example you could um put a review on TripAdvisor explaining why you thought this experience wasn't quite exactly what you thought I will say that TripAdvisor for example they usually don't like people explaining their, you know, their, you know, this elephant riding is wrong, you know, all of this kind of yes. thing. They don't like that. But if you can say, you know, be very specific about things that you noticed and maybe provide um, photographic evidence, you can spread the word on social media. You can do all sorts of things that will help other people learn from your experience as well. So yeah, even if you do go, you know, support something inadvertently that you didn't want to support, there are ways you can sort of use this for good. I, I agree. I, I think that's, I think that's wise. And I think we, one of the, the least effective things to do from any standpoint is to beat yourself up about things. It doesn't help anyone. Certainly doesn't help you. <laughs> it doesn't no. make you, it doesn't make you braver. It doesn't make you stronger. So I think it's very important. We all, because our awareness is continually growing. And at some point we may have other questions and things that we just don't know about. We don't know what we don't know. So. Exactly. I was, I was vegan for six months 
months and I took my elephant, my parents' elephant riding in Thailand. I just didn't really make that connection, even though I had been vegan for six months by then. This was back in 2009. But yeah, it just goes to show that uh, we all we all are on a bit of a path. <laughs> of course, we're never done. <laughs> we're no. never done. <laughs> so I don't I could talk to you about all of these experiences, but I would love to hear for our, for our listeners. We're going to be talking about your nine tips. And so please push on. Sure, sure. So I have these nine tips that I hope will be helpful for your listeners. So the first one is tip one is really adjusting your mindset. So, you know, this is again, a quote from a Colleen, you know, if you look through through a lens of lack, that is what you will see. And if you look through a lens of abundance, that is also what you will see. So, you know, if we start looking through the lens of lack, you know, be like, oh my gosh, there's never going to be anything for me at this restaurant. There's never going to be I'm going to make mistakes all the time. That is very often what your experience will be. But if you look through a lens of abundance, then you you will automatically be start thinking, hmm, I wonder what ingredients they seem to have on their menu. And maybe with a little bit of communication, a little bit of um, Google Translate, if necessary, maybe they're going to be able to... Um, pick something up for me in this restaurant or, you know, looking through um, Happy Cow as one of the apps that you can use. I'll talk about some more a little bit later. But, you know, oh, I wonder if there is some really great place for Japanese vegan food uh, in this particular place. I, I'm going to see if I can find it and I'm going to challenge myself to do so. So really adjusting our mindset is for many areas of our life, but not, not just for this, it's going to really make a big difference as to what your experience will actually be. So that's my first tip. Brilliant. I think, and that that's at the heart of everything I do is mindset. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So my tip two is to use apps and sites to help you. Now I've already mentioned happy cow. I'm not going to talk about that in depth because I think so many people know about happy cow and it's such a great app, but there are other apps as well that I think maybe your listeners might not know about. So for example, there can be country specific apps or websites that do a kind of similar thing to Happy Cow, but are specific to the destination that you're going to. So when I think about Happy Cow, it really is mostly a resource for English speakers, mostly. However, for example, in France, they have a website and app called Veggio Resto. And this app um, is basically like a happy cow for French speakers. And because it's for French speakers, it's much more in depth and it's not bound by some of the, the rules regarding listings that happy cow often has. And, you know, they have their rules for reasons, you know, they don't, for example, necessarily always have a lot of veg friendly restaurants in places where there's a lot of vegan restaurants. That's, that's some, a rule that they have had certainly in the past. I don't know whether they have that now. So Veggio Resto is a really great website to go and check out because it's for French speakers. But just because you don't speak French doesn't mean that it's not useful because you can get a lot even if you don't speak French because it's very similar set up to Happy Cow. So that's my next tip is to use country specific apps and sites. Another one is a billion. Are you familiar with a billion app, Michelle? I don't think so. Okay, so this is like a the brainchild of um, a Singaporean, um, I guess he's an, an entrepreneur called A Billion. And they are like a bit of like a happy cow, but they go a little bit deeper into that and in that they, they have like a social media feed as well. And they also, you can review and find vegan products on there too. And you can also search for dishes. So instead of whole restaurants being reviewed, mm -hmm. dishes in restaurants are reviewed as well. And what I really like about this app is that if you are a user of this app and you go on to review a, a dish, a product, a restaurant, then they will actually donate one US dollar to one of their sanctuaries. So as you're reviewing restaurants or dishes or whatever it is, you're kind of like 
saving up, let's say, a little bank of money, and then you get to um, donate that to one of their partner organizations. So for example, we have well, Vegan Travel has a connection with Great and Farmed Animal Sanctuary in South Africa. We went to visit them when we were in South Africa with a group in December. And they told us that $1,000 a month comes from a billion oh, wow. users. So they actually do get the money. And it's a really, really helpful, um, helpful website. So I definitely recommend downloading that. Another one is um, Veggie Hotels and Veggie Welcome. These websites are, as you can imagine, they have vegan, they are a listing of vegan hotels and very vegan friendly hotels. So what I really like about this is that, you know, you can um, go on there and you can find a vegan hotel. Now, I would love it if if um, every single city and town that we go to had a vegan hotel, but sadly that is not the case yet. And very often these accommodations are maybe little bed and breakfast in a little area of France that you might not necessarily have been going to, but if you really like the look of that place, of that hotel or that bed and breakfast or that accommodation, you know, why don't you go there and get off the beaten track a little bit and um, and enjoy this area of France that you might not know about anyway. So I absolutely love this website. Whenever we're de designing trips for our travelers, I always go on here and just on the off chance that there might be vegan hotels in the area that we're going to. Um, you never know, um, but you know, there are some amazing, wonderful vegan hotels that we actually stay at in Italy, Agrivilla e Pini. They're listed on the um, uh, Veggie Hotels website. La Vimia, which is another 100% vegan hotel, is also listed on their website that we go to. It's, it's, it's just wonderful. So those two are really great. And another two that I have, they're kind of a little bit similar, are Veg Visits, which is like an Airbnb for mm -hmm. vegans. So it's kind of a little bit like how Airbnb was 10 years ago when everybody had like beautiful, immaculate places with stunning photos. This is more like um, just for normal people. And these are these veg visit hosts are looking to host vegans and vegetarians in their home. And what I really like about this is, of course, you your money goes to vegans. So you know that they're not going to be spending their money on animal products. It's just a nice thing that you can do. And of course, you know, many of the hosts are keen to share their knowledge about their city as well. Maybe they'll have some recommendations for you as well. And then another one, which is a really interesting one, is called The Vegan Stay. They, they are kind of like an Airbnb as well. But something that they also do is the, they are trying to make themselves like a, a place for for sanctuaries to list their accommodations as well. So in case you don't know, a lot of the time sanctuaries have some sort of accommodations on their property as well to help raise money for looking after the animals and to give the, their guests a better, more interesting experience. And um, they often list these on places like Airbnb and things like that. But of course, Airbnb takes a really big fee from this, whereas the vegan stay, it will actually donate those fees back to the sanctuaries. And in fact, all fees from the vegan stay will go to sanctuaries as well. So this is a really interesting option. Um, they've only been around for six months and I really recommend people check them out. What a great idea. And these are, these are for, for sure for me, I, I, mean, I haven't heard of most of these. That's marvelous. And it makes for a completely different sort of vacation too. Absolutely. Absolutely. By digging into these ones, you could have a completely different experience than, mm. you know, a, a fully inclusive beach uh, holiday, for example. That's great. I, I love these because happy cow, I, I have, you know, I, I'm not always a big fan of happy cow because I feel like they always push me towards smoothie places and, and, and veggie burger places, which is not a problem. I just, 
when I'm traveling, that's, I don't want to just eat that all the time or bring my the rest of my family to those sorts of places all the time. Of course. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I often find myself going to the highly rated places, um, which I feel like uh, I feel like I maybe miss out on um, some other experiences as well. So I think trying to switch things up a little bit and try different places is really helpful. These are great. Okay, so tip three is consider packing some particular supplies or tools to help you a little bit. So my first one is a little bit of Tupperware. This is really helpful for carrying like leftovers um, from the restaurant. You can eat it all. I like to have these little collapsible Tupperware so they don't take so much space in there. And I can also use them to transport, you know, maybe squishable snacks like delicious cherry tomatoes or grapes or something like that. I can just, it allows me to carry these healthy snacks a little bit more easy. And also for packing picnic supplies, I, we often pack picnics when we go away. We, you know, we buy deli slices, vegan deli slices and cheeses in a city um, when we arrive and then we use them throughout their trip. So I need to have something to carry them. So that's really helpful. A sharp knife is really helpful as long as you have it in your carry-on to you know, get into fruits and, and vegetables, things like that. Um, a tea towel is really, really great. It's like a little tablecloth, like wiping your hands. I even carry with me, depending on the trip that I'm going to, like a, a cool bag with a blue brick, like an, do you know what I mean? Like a little- yes. Yeah. cooler or of gel, uh, gel pack yeah 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 exactly. the frozen freezer freezer packs what are they called <laughs> yeah I, blue, I don't know blue bricks but I, yeah. I always like to have these with me when I'm traveling so I can carry those um picnic supplies uh safely but also so I can take yummy things home with me as well so I keep on using France as an example but for example France has some incredible vegan cheeses that are just not available in North America and how wonderful is it to be able to you know stock up on a few of those before you go home and then you can give them as gifts or for friends and family members, or you can um, just enjoy them when you get home. So we always have a little cool bag with the blue brick that we freeze. We ask the hotel to freeze if we don't have a freezer in the room. Um, and if they have a problem with that, I I might sometimes say a little white lie and say I need it frozen for medication, medication or something like yeah, that. That's, that's the white <laughs> lie we all use. <laughs> uh-huh. Um, just to make sure that it is actually frozen. Another couple of things that I will often carry depending on where I'm going is some shelf stable non-dairy milk to crack open in cases of emergency because I really love to have coffee in the morning and um, some cutlery as well. I also like to sometimes carry some healthy snacks as well, uh, just in case. And I have been known to even carry some small appliances as well. So I have carried a little travel blender in the past. Um, if you're going camping um, uh, and you're staying at a campsite with power, you might even like to bring a instant pot or if you're in your RV or even if you're in a hotel room, you can actually take uh, an instant pot, assuming of course they allow that kind of thing. So these are other ways, other things that you might pack if you want to um, um, eat a little bit more healthy. <laughs> Great ideas. So my fourth tip is to consume nutrient rich foods a few times a day. Now, Michelle, how does your eating go when you are on a vacation? Do you find that you eat a bit differently? Um, in general, I'm well, because I'm, I'm pretty experienced now as a, just as a as a woman in my 60s, I am used to eating what I think is good for me now. Um, as a younger person, I might have pushed the boat out with different things, you know, and gone, oh, when will I be back here? But no, I don't. Um, I am pretty, pretty nutrient oriented at this point in my life. But I do think um, it's good to just make sure that you are forcing yourself to remember those those fiber filled greens and grains, right? Mm. Oh, Absolutely. Absolutely. And I find one of, for me, one of the best 
ways to do this is to make my breakfast as nutrient dense as possible. Because very often if you're staying in a hotel, there might be some vegan options, but they're not necessarily particularly healthy and they're not that exciting, to be Mm. honest. So may as well bank up and get some nutrients in breakfast, considering the alternatives are not very good anyway. So I really suggest to people to, um, you know, really eat as many fruits and vegetables and fiber filled foods as they can for breakfast so that uh, later on in the day, they could maybe indulge a little bit more with the knowledge that they have, you know, at least got a few serves of good stuff first thing in the morning. And also you feel a little more, um, I think, more confident that you're you're not doing without. You know you've taken good care of yourself first thing. So if you don't have the options that you had hoped somewhere, that you can just relax a little bit and know that you are are taking good care of yourself. But you know, for breakfast, we were just talking about this. My husband and I have found that the full in, full English vegan breakfast that's now available in many English and and British hotels is a blast because I'm not a breakfast eater in general, and to see the beans and the and the mu- mushrooms and um, the avocado toasts and the cauliflower crisp, I mean, it's just been that I don't usually eat breakfast until I'm in the UK. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yes, I would probably find it hard to pass up um, that in exchange for a, a plate of salad and vegetables. I, I agree. But if if the options are not great, then definitely go for the nutrient filled stuff. Great point. Another couple of things that you can do is like... Um, Think about a greens powder as well. Uh, Some sort of greens powder is a really helpful thing to add into your diet. Less so for just like a weekend away because it's just two days. But if you're doing longer term travel, then carrying some sort of greens powder, which usually contains a lot of micronutrients, is a good way to cover your nutritional bases. And also, you know, consider packing or buying as snacks some freeze dried vegetable snacks, um, kale chips, or maybe some sort of dried fruit or fruit leather, um, and stocking up on local produce as well. And when I talk about like local produce, I'm not necessarily talking about like an apple that maybe isn't that exciting for me anyway. But, you know, for example, if you're in Southern Italy, get a a couple of pounds of those incredible Italian cherry tomatoes and that are so sweet and delicious and eat them as snacks or pineapple that you can get off the street in Thailand that is so juicy and sweet and blows pineapple from at home out of the water and just you know gorge yourself and enjoy on that this is these are really nice things to do and you know depending on how long you're traveling and what your supplement needs are you might want to pack vitamin supplement and b12 as well that's a good idea yeah Okay, so my tip five is to like write a bit of a wish list ahead of time. So these this is really sort of focused on people that really do want to make the most of the vegan food that is available in the place that they are going to. So something that you can do is to, you know, go and search online. I don't know whether listeners are aware of this, but some bloggers have done really great jobs of creating like these city vegan travel guides, for example, a vegan guide to Barcelona. And in this, in these guides, they will list a number of interesting places and of course they've got photos and things like that so by looking and researching this kind of stuff in advance you can see hmm I really feel like checking out this place I really feel like checking out this other place Um, you can also think about video content as well like there is an increasing number of vegan food bloggers or youtubers I should say um, that are creating content like this so what you can do is do a little bit of research get yourself excited and I don't know whether you do this Michelle but you can actually star on Google Maps the the places that you're interested in so once you star them you'll have these groups of stars on 
let's say Roma, for example. So you can see at a glance if if you've just come out of the Colosseum, for example, you can see, oh, wow, I knew there was this place. There's this place that I'm really interested in. It's just like three blocks away. Now is the perfect time to go and check that out. I totally agree. That is such an important thing to do. I am a, I am a homework. I'm a planner. Uh -huh. um, in most cases, a lot of people don't want that they want to show up and they want to experience and I I, mm -hmm. I admire that but they want to just like discover and I always think it's so much easier to discover if you have one or two things on the list to at least ex to at least kind of check out every day because just I don't know maybe it's my neurodivergent brain I don't know but I have a hard time just completely being in discovery mode I like to have a few things on the to-do list to just um, give the day some shape, you know. I I agree. You know, I'm all about being a little spontaneous and checking out that cute little cafe and sitting sitting on the patio there. But you know, I am a bit of a vegan foodie. I want to make sure I I get this vegan tiramisu whilst I'm in Rome. I definitely want to make sure that I hit that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I missed it because I was so full. We went to a place called Origano. It's a small chain in Rome. Do you know? Do you know this? I have. Yeah. And they have a lot of vegan, beautiful things. And I wanted when I saw that there was a vegan tiramisu, I was like, I'm definitely going to have that. But we ate so much food, it was just not going to happen. Yeah, Rome has <laughs> vegan food in abundance. It's amazing. <laughs> You'll have to go back. <laughs> right. we'll, we will indeed. So my next tip, tip six, is to let your accommodations know ahead of time that you are coming and that you're vegan. Now, I will choose whether I do this or not, depending on how long I'm staying there and whether there are other vegan options around me. So, for example, if I'm spending the night in Paris, I'm probably not going to let the accommodation know that um, I'm vegan because... I'm not going to eat dinner there because there are lots of other great options. And I'm if usually I don't want to have breakfast included, particularly not in Paris, because I happen to know there's an amazing place with incredible almond croissants just down the street. So I'm not going to bother inconveniencing anyone at this time. Um, but if I was, to, for example, to do a one week vacation in a beach resort without many vegan options around, you bet I'm going to um, definitely let them know ahead of time. I'm going to maybe ask to be in contact with the food and beverage manager and get, you know, a few um, reassurances that there's going to be something there for me. And, you know, if they need it, some help for me to support them in making sure that we have a good experience. So I really like to do this in certain cases. And I always like to give feedback directly to the hotel at the end of my stay. I'm not really about blasting someone on social media if they have been um, less than stellar. Um, but I'd, I love to give some feedback, you know, positive and areas that they might like to improve on. You know, if I feel like it, I'm on holiday. Maybe I don't want to do that. But uh, if I have the time and the inclination, I do like to give that feedback and say, oh, my gosh. Yeah. Thank you for having soy milk. But you might find that this other brand of soy milk might be better because, you know, it doesn't curdle in coffee, for example. This is all mm -hmm. not as sweet. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's a good point. And, you know, I, I have a couple of times stayed places where they brought me a beaut. I didn't mention it because I wasn't staying very long. They brought me a big charcuterie board, you know, in the room oh, as a welcome. Right. And, uh, and so I do say now, and even that doesn't always work because sometimes the penny just doesn't drop. They're just like, yeah, yeah well, I, it's not dinner. It's just a snack. <laughs> you know? yeah. 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 Very, very often that happens to us as well. There'll be some sort of vegan perishable, sorry, non-vegan non -vegan. perishable thing. So, you know, while I'm not always successful at this, as soon as I check into that, I'm like, you want to get this out of here because I'm definitely not going to eat it. And I really don't want it to go to waste for so yes. many reasons. Exactly. Get exactly. someone to come and take it out. So yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting that very often the message doesn't quite get through. Yes. My seventh tip is to learn or to have access to a little of the language. And I'm not suggesting that in order to have a 
beach trip in Mexico, you need to become fluent in Spanish at all. But learning a little bit of the language can be really helpful. And there's a few ways that you can do this. Um, I'm sure most people know about Google Translate on their phone. It's an app that you can download. But I think a lot of people don't know some of the features of Google Translate that can be really, really helpful. So first of all, you can, ahead of time, you can actually download the language that you're going to. Um, so for example, if you're going to Spain, you can download Spanish. So it's always going to be on your phone, whether you have internet connection or not. So you don't need to worry about, you know, internet. Um, your Wi-Fi um, password in your restaurant or whatever. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's always there. And you can even put in a few phrases ahead of time and star them so that you're not frantically trying to um, type these things that you can basically, you know, have a phrase that explains what vegan is and a few other things so that you just have to go there and just show the server there. They also have this kind of like um, a lens feature as well on Google Translate. So it's in the little camera icon on Google Translate. And basically you choose that and then you hold it up to some sort of text in the target language in Spanish, for example. And it just does this Harry Potter thing and translates it in front of your very eyes. So this is really good for menus and for um, ingredients lists as well. It, it's, it's really quite cool. It's not perfect, no. But it is able to translate some very funky looking fonts that you might think, oh, I'm sure it can't translate that, but it, mm. it does an okay job. And you can even speak into Google Translate or have the person that you're speaking to speak into Google Translate and have it all um, translate like in real time as you're going. So this is really cool. And of course, you can use the microphone and speak. Um, speaker option to check your pronunciation if you're looking at the written form as well or this is particularly helpful if you are um, working with a script that isn't you know easy for us like Thai for example that has a different mm. script and it's very hard to read the Thai script so this is helpful as well Another tip as well is to consider having a few language lessons. Uh, there's some really great platforms like italki to do this. You can find a teacher. You don't have to dig deep into the language. You can just say, I just want to learn a few phrases that are going to come in useful. I want you to correct my pronun pronunciation and, um, and give me a few you know, be a bit of an expert, not only in the language, but, but as someone from that country, like I'm sure they would be able to answer a lot of questions as well. So this is really, really helpful as well. I think, I think that's brilliant because the other issue of that is sometimes um, at home, you may be thinking, I know what to ask for. I know what to say, but you're not confronted with the situation and the food and the way it's being served. And so it, someone who's from that community, from that that culture can say, yeah, but they're not going to ask you then they're going to ask you here or they're not. Oh, there's yes. always going to be cheese in it. No matter what they say, there will always be cheese or there'll never be cheese in that. Don't worry. <laughs> so a few little tips like that can really help you be a little more effective in what you're what you're trying to communicate. Absolutely. Absolutely. I use italki. I'm a bit of a language learner as well. And I use italki. And, you know, I, I also become friends with my teachers as well. And um, it's just a wonderful experience all mm. around. <laughs> and another thing that you can just avoid the technology entirely and just have an old school language sheet as well. You can you can create a table in a Google Doc or word processor, and then you can put those phrases into, um, into Google Translate and copy and paste them, print it out, just keep it in your purse, pull it out when you're having a meal and you're, you're good to go. That's great. Uh, so nearly two more. Two more tips. The first one is to leverage social media. Um, so social media is great for many reasons. And um, I've noticed that a lot of people in a destination, they will often hashtag the name vegan plus the destination. So for example, hashtag vegan Seville. If you start looking, if you're going to Seville and you 
search for hashtag vegan Seville or vegans in Seville or something like that, you're going to find a lot of stuff, some um, that maybe events or things like that that you can take advantage of that might not necessarily have made it onto a blog post yet or onto Happy Cow yet. This is a really great thing that you can do to find some stuff that's maybe not one of the most obvious things. And you can also leverage Facebook groups or other online communities in the destination that you're going to. So for example, Vegans of Thailand. This is a Facebook group that I am a member of and I've participated in a lot. And you could go in there and you can ask questions. Now, it probably wouldn't necessarily be the most helpful or best use of everyone's time if you said, what's the best Thai rest Thai vegan restaurant in Bangkok? Because this is all information that is very easily available online. But you could use it to get some information on that sanctuary that you're just not quite sure about. Um, so, you know, I've seen this sanctuary. What do you think about it? What's your experience there? And vegans, you know, because they have looked through a similar lens to what you do, they can say, oh, you know, I'm not sure about that. I've heard some things that it's not really a sanctuary, for example, or they might say something like, oh yeah, this place is really legit. You'll definitely want to go check this out and you can definitely feel good supporting them. And meetups.com, for example, is another website where you can connect with people in like in real time. Maybe they've got some events that are going on, whether it's some activism or just like a meetup to go and eat at a nice restaurant and you can make some local friends there. So that is a really, really fun thing to do. And my last tip, tip nine, is, you know, if you don't want to do any of those things that I just said, because it just all sounds like hard work, then you might like to consider using a vegan travel professional. There are some vegan tour operators like World Vegan Travel, what we do, and there are even quite a few vegan travel agents like travel advisors in the more sort of traditional sense of the word and they can liaise with hotels they can find out whether the hotel is going to align with your values you know maybe it's not going to completely align with your values but they don't have a dolphin show in the in the hotel for example so using vegan travel professionals can really make the whole travel planning and experience a whole lot better so those are all of my nine tips Michelle <laughs> Friday that is a lot that is a lot and I you know I think of myself as somebody who travels uh you know of, regularly anyway and uh, you're giving me some great ideas I'm wondering now you you are the tour operator do you also provide um travel consultation advice for for clients like do, can sometimes people call and uh, say itinerary advice no that's not your thing no we're not like a travel advisor in that sense so off the top of my head there are a few that I know about Donna Zyke Finger from Green Earth Travel um, Jason McGregor from Vegan Vacations they are um, vegan travel advisors and of course they want to make sure that you know your honeymoon moon if if, if that's what um, one of your listeners might be planning with you and your significant other that uh, that it will be a vegan experience so they're good for that we're as a tour operator we are creating group tours for people so you know you sign up for one of our tours and you have that experience rather than an advisory role well tell me about some that are coming up some tours that are opening up sure sure so we have a few that are still available for 2023 that I think are pretty exciting. We are nearly sold out of our um, Tuscany with trip with Colleen Patrick Goudreau, where we're staying in a vegan vegan hotel for a week and we're going to be doing little excursions from there so visiting a lot of Tuscan towns and villages um, going having a dreamy um, vegan lunch in the Crete Senesi and the Val d'Orcia with uh, with visiting a place that also has a sanctuary on its grounds we're going to be of course doing vegan wine tasting all of that kind of stuff so that's one 
And our other two trips that are not yet currently sold out are to France. One is um, the, a French countryside trip, which starts in Paris and finishes in Bordeaux. So it goes all through the southwest of France in the Loire Valley, in the Dordogne. Now, I'm sure most of your listeners know that France is not a very vegan friendly destination and when I say that I mean that the culinary cuisine is not very vegan friendly of course France has some of the most um, famous cuisine in the world uh, and I think only ratatouille <laughs> is vegan <laughs> everything else is non-vegan of course there are places that create vegan versions of that so we're going through France and to southwest of France which is even less vegan friendly than most of the rest of France is as well. So of course we're gonna be veganizing uh, traditional and regional fr French food, making it vegan. And of course we're gonna be staying in incredible chateaus in the Loire Valley, doing canoe rides on the Dordogne River, doing lots of wine stuff, visiting the Europe's first elephant sanctuary for retired circus and zoo elephants as well. That's going to be a lot of fun. That's in September. And then in December, um, we have a trip from Paris to Alsace in December because we um, are enjoying all of the Alsace towns and cities during that very cozy time of year where there's lots of uh, Christmas markets and uh, generally having like a big sort of Christmas holiday fest. And all three of those trips are in collaboration with Colleen Patrick Boudreau, the Joyful Vegan as well. Um, we have just finished running two trips to Africa. We just did South Africa and Botswana. Um, just, I got back three days ago from that. Uh, but the trips that I just said are the ones that we have left for 2023. Well, I don't want to, I don't want to take advantage of your time too much, but I am curious, especially France. I am a Francophile. I have not been to Alsace, but I remember the Christmas <gasps> markets that I have been to in, uh, in France. And I remember with great joy, the, the bowls of mushrooms, which are fabulous, but they had some cream in them. And, um, and so I always think about that. How would I ever get that experience again? Just minus the dairy. Um, but you must have to, when you are creating these tours, you're putting them together, you must have to work with non-vegan chefs and staff and help them. Um, how open do you find them in general? Sure, sure. Generally speaking, very open. And specifically in the case of Alsace, it's quite a nice story, actually. So um, Seb, my partner, he is the one that kind of like sources out the hotels and like finds a little short list of places that he thinks will be able to meet our, meet our needs and what we think our travelers want. And of course, they're not always vegan, far from it. So then the next question that we ask them is we say something like, um, OK, so we want to come and stay in your hotel for a week. We want to take over the whole hotel. Um, and this is a true story for our Alsace hotel. So, you know, straight away they're like, oh, this is interesting because <laughs> taking over a whole hotel for a whole week. Um, but, and uh, we say this is what we want to do, but we want to make it um, vegan. It's going to be a bit of a learning curve if you've not done this before. And we're going to be requiring something that is equivalent to what your non-vegan guests will be getting. But we want it to be made vegan. It's going to require a learning curve and it's going to require a bit of work. Are you ready for something like that? And, you know, they say yes or no. And most of the time they say yes. And if they agree, you know, we we make the agreement, we sign the contracts, all of those kinds of things. And then uh, in the example of this Alsace hotel that I'm talking about, La Couronne in Ensisheim, which is this small Alsatian village, it just so happened that they have a vegan grocery store just 20 minutes down the road. So they didn't know that. And so basically the chef and the manager, they went down to the vegan grocery store and spent half a day talking with the owner of that store to look at their different vegan products and what products 
um, could be good to replace the non-vegan versions. So for example, an Alsatian specialty is choucroute, which is like um, sauerkraut. And it's normally served with non-vegan sausages. So they suggested, well, these sausages would be a good replacement. And of course, you know, we make sure that we have a cheese platter for every meal. So what would be the best vegan cheeses to put on a cheese platter? Where can they source vegan croissants or panel chocolat so that they can have those on the breakfast? So it's, it's a bit of a process um, depending on the destination that we're going. Um, but generally speaking, they're really open to it. And uh, I think that's just testament to the chefs in that they probably do want to work on creating more vegan food but they just don't necessarily have the time and resources to do so it's only when they're kind of like forced for want of a better word into that they're like okay well now I've now I've got to like expand my repertoire and knowledge of products and ingredients a little bit and it's 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 a fun process I always ask for feedback from our hotels on the experiences that they have had working with us and you know they always say unless they're not being truthful but they always say they feel like they've learned a lot about um, vegan foods throughout the process so it's a lot of fun I really enjoy it. Well, I, I'm glad that you really enjoy it. It sounds like you really enjoy it. And it sounds like you rely on tip number one, which is mindset, to look for how it could work, which is so important. There's so many, there's so many ways to just decide now it won't work. But when you look for how it could work, and then what a, that gives up everybody else that um that uh inspiration to go, well, I wonder if it could work, what I would do. Exactly. I agree. I agree. <laughs> that is marvelous. Bridie, thank you so much. This is Bridie Reed from World Vegan Travel. There's no part of the world we're not uh, talking about here. And there were nine tips that you shared with us. And I so appreciate it, Bridie. Thank you so much for being with us on Veg Your Best. Michelle, thank you so much for having me. I've had a blast. We're going to have all the links to how to reach you and see what tours are coming up for you uh, in the show notes. So um, nobody will have to do too much research to find you. Fantastic. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. So, so what did you think of Bridie Reed? Nine tips for vegan travel anywhere. I'm sure you're going to be incorporating some of those ideas. Uh, well, starting with number one, right? Mindset. If you wanted to be in your comfort zone every single minute, then you probably wouldn't travel much. But the whole point of travel is to see and experience something different. Now, I'll be listening to this episode when it goes live. Um, I'll be in Spain. And you know, I will be using some of these great tips, including having some reusable containers for snacks or leftovers, especially with grandchildren nearby. I'm going to have a cheat sheet of Spanish phrases in case I just fry out in my, uh, in my Spanish and run into some sort of failure to communicate my vegan requests. And of course, I'll do some preemptive planning. World Vegan Travel itself has a huge number of resources just on their website. It could not be easier to remember either. Worldvegantravel.com. So I encourage you to log on, look around, and be inspired. And of course, contact Bridie with any questions. She always has some amazing luxury vegan tour in the works. And, uh, and I almost forgot, she has the World Vegan Travel Podcast for all things vegan travel. So get out there. Get out there and plan a trip, my veg your bestie. And while you're doing that, you can, well, you can veg your best. And I'll see you next week. Veg Your Best podcast production, music, and editing by Charlie Weinshank. Thanks, Charlie. Before you go, it would mean so much to me and the Veg Your Best team if you would hit subscribe, leave us a five-star review, or share with someone you think might be interested. Something about algorithms, it helps bump us up a little in the rankings, and that's the best way to help others find the podcast and for us to find our audience. So until next week, make it easy and veg your best.